What is Demon Copperhead? Uh, it's a book. It's a pretty cool book. What's it? What's it about? Give us the overview. Because I've is. been, I've, I've read uh, slash read, listened to. Because I'm audio booking it, Colorado and back. Let's see what I read. I read uh, uh, "Killing the Killers" by Bill O'Reilly. I've reread uh, Jack Carr's last book, and then I read "Killing Patton" in the last in the last month. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of, that's not really, that's, uh, you're not really into fiction or. Jack Carr's book was fiction. It's all fiction. Know. Yeah. It's, uh, Jack Carr was a Navy SEAL and, and he's got a series out. The terminal list series is what it's referred to. But his last one was, um, uh, only the dead, I think. And, um, can't remember for sure but that's his sixth book it's getting ready for his seventh to come out in the series yeah demon copperhead is just like uh it's kind of like a i put it like in a new genre that's maybe just been going on for maybe like the last 10 to 15 years it's like i wouldn't know what you'd call it but it's like kind of like gritty rural uh, it's really rural based fiction so i'd put it in that category but it's like it's set like probably 1990s in appalachia and it's just like this uh i think why i like it is because it just it feel like i know tons of people like this but he's just this young kid who's comes from a screwed up family and you know, his mom ODs and whoever his mom's like, his dad's dead and she marries some biker dude and then she ODs and then he gets thrown into the foster care system. And it just kind of, you know, all that kind of gritty stuff that sounds depressing. No, it's not because it's, he's a really good, he's a good kid. Like, even though he's in a really screwed up situation, like he's a really good kid. So I kind of relate to that, not because I didn't grow up like that or anything, but you didn't grow we, up in Appalachia either. You wouldn't call it Appalachia. Is it? Is it? <laughs> which which way do you say it? Appalachia. Appalachia. If you're from there, it's Appalachia. Yeah, yeah. But in a, in a lot of ways, where I'm at is, is really close. Is it? It culturally is really close to that. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, you look at the culture, Appalachia. I mean, it extends all the way down. If you look at their true definition of it, it includes my area where I'm from is the foothills right here on the Ohio River. And from Maine all the way through, I mean, think Maryland. Maryland, Appalachia Mountains runs right through Maryland all the way down into Alabama. Yeah, this is set in in Virginia and to a degree Tennessee. But yeah, I mean, and if anybody's into that kind of stuff, like Demon Copperhead, it's a good book. I'm not totally finished with it yet, but it's a good book. It's not near as good as, uh, I should say that it is near, it is near as good, but it's not as good as, uh, there's an author called Donald Ray Pollock and, uh, he wrote a book called Knock 'em Stiff which is Ohio based Appalachia. And, uh, that's an amazing, amazing book. Like people who are like, yeah, I don't like to read, you know, no, like if you think you don't like to read, pick up, knock, knock them stiff. And if you can't read that, then no, nah, you got no hope. <laughs> and he also, he also wrote a book called devil all the time, which they made a they made a movie of, it used to be on Netflix. I don't have Netflix anymore, but it used to be on Netflix. Good movie, as you know, cliche to say. The movie's not as good as the book, but sure, yeah, yeah. I like fiction. Um, I also like. I mean, I got a whole bookshelf full of books and stuff that I read, like, um, you know, d- development books, 
and got backbone of courage by a um, guy by the name of Lee that was an army officer. And I just like, I like reading stuff like that, stuff that I can learn from. But sometimes I'm like you. I like, sometimes it's like the, you know, the whole Jack Carr series is um, all fiction based. But I, I, even when I watch stuff, I'm more drawn to like factual based, based on a true story type uh, uh, narrative, storylines, scripts, stuff like that. I like. Yeah. I, I, prefer, I prefer to read fiction. But yeah, if I'm going to watch TV, I'm watching documentaries or something like that. Yeah, I just like I just like factual stuff, but I like to be entertained, too. I mean, heck. If a new Superman movie came out right now, I'd like I'd, I'd go to the theater and watch it. <laughs> I I've mean, never, there ain't anything I, factual about that. I've never been into superheroes. Like, oh, never, man. It never struck me. Star Wars, when I remember sitting in the theater, it was 1976, I think, is when the original Star Wars movie came out. And uh, we'd never seen anything like that on the screen. And my dad, like, taking us to the movies and stuff, and we went and watched it with him. But, but um, you know, I was like eight years old when that movie came out. The newer Star Wars stuff, I I wouldn't I wouldn't even waste the time on it. But the the original six, I watched them all, and yeah, it took I'm, like thirty six years. <laughs> My aunt took me to see the original Star Wars in the movie theater, and even as a kid, I was impressed. <laughs> you weren't impressed as a kid? No, I, I've just never been into that. I've never been into that kind of. Uh, you know, I like. I like movies and, f and fiction, but and you know, I do like some science fiction. But I think I can just relate more when it's like based in, like I was talking about that book. Like I can, re I know those characters. Like I already know what's going on. Like it's a mm -hmm. it's a familiar place. I don't know outer space and and all that kind of stuff. And it just never really struck a chord with me. I don't know. I I'm kind of one of those. It it really fits my personality. I like a lot of different stuff, and um, there's a few things that I get more into than other stuff. But just being well rounded, you know, I guess it, my wife wouldn't tell you that, but um, and I know other people that are a lot more culturally well rounded than I am for sure. But um, I, I don't know. I like a, I like a wide variety, I guess. But Western stuff, um, any of the fur trade stuff, you know, I can almost recite Jeremiah Johnson and the Mountain Men and and stuff like that. That stuff all draws me in. I've I've read the historical accounts of Jedediah Smith and and uh, Liver Eating Johnson. You know that book, um, Alan Eckert's books about the Dark and Bloody Ground, Tecumseh. Um, you know, all of those books I've read, I've read all that stuff. The Frontiersman. I can't remember the, the actual name of it, but have you read that? Uh, it's not the autobiography, but the biography of uh, Tom Horn, the Indian Scout. I know who Tom Horn is, but I don't know that. It's been years since I've read it, but you should. Look I don't know that I've read the book. I've seen the I've seen the movie that Paul Newman was in. I've done re read a ton of stuff on Tom Horn, but I don't know that I've read a specific book. I've watched documentaries about him and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, I, I just remember that it was a good book. I don't remember much about it. That's how I am. I can reread really stuff because my memory's so bad. Like I can I go through my I can go through my bookcase and be like, "No, that book was bad. That book was okay. That book was good." But if you ask me why they were good or the storyline most of them i can't tell it to you so it makes re i can reread it's a it's awesome like to be like that you know it's like nypd blue came out in 1993 or i think the first one came out in 93 and i just started re-watching the seasons of nypd blue because i've seen them all yeah best cop show that that was ever produced in my opinion and i just started re-watching it and i've probably watched the series two or three times but it's been like probably 10 years it's like watching it all over again 
<laughs> yeah, I never really watched it, so I can't say it wasn't the best. But my favorite cop show was uh, Starsky and Hutch. No, no, no. Before that, uh, once, <laughs> once again, my memory comes in here. Rockford it's Files. That one wasn't bad, but no, before that. <laughs> uh, Andy Griffith. No, no, no. That's the best cop show ever made. I just tell you that. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I can't remember that actor's name, but he's a liberal. Which one? The, the sheriff. Uh, uh, Andy Ta- Andy Griffith? Yeah. He yeah. is as liberal as they come in real life. It's a good show. He's dead now. What's the, I'm trying to I'm a trying liberal to back then though is like a is like a not far off of a conservative from today. I mean a, a oh, middle no. ground I mean, conservative. He, he was a liberal like way after that. Yeah. Let's try to figure out this this cop show. I I want to think I want to say it's Bill Street Blues. No, it's probably early to mid seventies. Uh. Hmm. Uh, One Adam 12. No. It's like, it's really 70, late 60s, 70 ish. Uh, but they like, for the time period, they tackled like some really big, like there was gay people on there. It wasn't pro gay, but there was gay people on there. They talked about racism. And I keep wanting to say Archie Bunker. It's the cop. He did the night. No, that's another good one. But before that, uh, was it Joe Friday? No, a Bagoda was was a small character in it. Hmm. Uh, ah, well, let's go on. It'll it'll hit mod, me here like Mod Squad. No, <laughs> it'll hit me here in like fifteen minutes, just like out of the blue. Yeah, yeah. No, I, the the reason I asked you about that book is it's just. You know, we we featured uh, Tracy Jones, T.L. Jones, and he wrote a book called The Old Men. And then I've been kind of up my reading game. And, and I, man, I'll tell you what, reading is something that just, and I know there's a big difference. I was talking to my wife about this the other day. I prefer, if I'm really going to get into something, like a lot of the books that I have, backbone of leadership gates of fire stuff like that i mean i stuck, i got stuff highlighted in those books and when you're doing an audio book that you're listening to going down the road you know you can't highlight stuff so it's almost like cheating but but it, it there's there's always value in reading stuff and that killing Patton book man i'm telling you what if you haven't read it i strongly recommend it because you will see how Closing in on the end of World War II, we had the opportunity as a culture between us and Great Britain of just stopping the the Russians, the Soviet Union at the time. And, and the way we appeased them and capitulated and did all this stuff, we gave them the lifeblood they needed. And we're paying for it today. With communism and everything. I mean, maybe you know the answer, but I've never really, I've never understood this. So, World War II uh, ends, it's over. I think we kind of, I think we kind of touched on it at some point. It may just been on the phone, but like the Russians won World War II. We were allies, they, but they, they did the heavy lifting. They, they won that war. You and think- then, like, it's, Oh, yeah, yeah. No way. No yeah. way. Yeah, no. they did. Were they fighting in North Africa? Did they go through Italy? Did they land on the beaches of Normandy? We let them win that war. If you if you look at the history, we let them win it. Patton was stopped before he could cross the. He was. They wanted to hold him up before he crossed the Rhine. Monty Montgomery was sitting up there afraid to come into to Germany and holding his army back. But the, the bureaucrats, the politicians, the, the top dogs, FDR, came down through Ike all the way down. Patton could have could have rolled into into Berlin 
almost two weeks before yeah. the Russians even got there. But, I mean, the Russians did. I mean, yeah, the Russians weren't on all the other fronts. You know, they were concerned about their back door. Yeah. It doesn't really matter one way. It doesn't really matter to my question one way or the other. But so why, like, as soon as World War II ends, it's like a weird deal. Like, so Germany's our enemy. We beat them. We win. And then all of a sudden we just start, I mean, I understand why we pulled all their scientists and uh, mechanical engineers and uh, rocket science and all that because those people, well, I think we were talking about that the other day. They're just, mm-hmm. those people are just like mechanical minded people. Yep. So we pulled all that. We pulled all those like intellectual resources. We gave a bunch of them to Russia. But then we just like totally turned on Russia and it was like, okay, now they're our enemy. And it's like, they were just our ally. And then it's like, why, why do we turn them into our enemy? If you like want that? to know the answer to those questions, you really should listen, read that book. Killing Patton, right? O'Reilly does such a good job of uh, bringing all the facts together and laying them out there and spelling a lot of that out. And I've watched and read this and heard this and, you know, all the books from objective writers will tell you that, that FDR was Churchill, Churchill knew he, he understood the dangers of the Russians. Patton understood the dangers of the Russians. The German Empire understood the Germans or the dangers of Russia. And we were trying to appease them, thinking that, well, if we play nice to them, maybe we can be friends. And Stalin wasn't about that at all. Stalin killed more people, almost 10 times as many people, as Hitler ever thought about killing. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's not and he idiot. starved him. He he sent him to Siberia. He gassed him. He killed him. He did all kinds of stuff. You know, they 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 gobbled up Vietnam POWs from. They bought them from from the North Vietnamese. That's American POWs. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. The Vietnam government wanted wanted four billion dollars for our POWs, and we said we're not paying for POWs. So they sold them to Russia. Tons of a lot of them. I don't know how many, but there's there's a bunch of them. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. Yep, yep. Bar- Barney Miller. Barney Miller. <laughs> yeah, yeah, buddy. <laughs> oh yeah, that was a good, that was a good one. That's an early one. Yeah. yeah, that's the one I'm trying to remember. That's a good show. Yeah, yeah. Totally. I told you it was just coming to me. That's off topic. So right, don't carry on the way we're going. Yeah, but anyway, I don't know. I just the reason the reason I was thinking about when I saw you posting a book, it's like, I think as a, as a community, as in general, Americans don't read enough. And we, why don't people want to have more information or be more educated? Do we just totally tr- distrust the system and, and think well, that everybody's of too lying to yeah. us or what? A lot of it's crap, you know, a lot of it's boring and, and who there's a lot of the who wants to read it, you know? So you, you come out of school where you probably got forced to read stuff you didn't want to read. Like I was really lucky and went to really cool schools where, you know, we had, you know, kind of like our basic that everybody had to read, but then, you know, it wasn't like everybody's going to read to kill a mockingbird which isn't a bad book, you know, our teachers for the most part would give us a list of like 40 books, you know, and it was like pick two this year, Mm -hmm. three this year, whatever. So you could go pick them up and, you know, try them. And, and, you know, out out of those books, you could find something that you like. So we weren't forced to read stuff that we just didn't like. I mean, you do that to anybody on anything and they're not going to like it. Yep. That's why I, I that's why I was saying like if somebody thinks they don't like to read, read one of those three books I just mentioned. Mm-hmm. And if you're anything like me, like you're gonna love them. You just gotta yep. find the stuff you want to read. And people right. don't have the attention span. Now, like you're saying, like it's cheating to listen. Like I don't listen to many audiobooks, because uh, for one, they put me to sleep. Like 
I like an audiobook when I'm driving. Mm-hmm. But I can't hardly listen to audiobooks like at home because I just end up going to sleep. Constantly. I'm the same way. I'm the same but way. I don't really think I don't really think it's <laughs> cheating because we're still You're absorbing information that you wouldn't get. Yeah, or in fiction, I'm sitting there, I'm still like making up the movie mm-hmm. images in my head, whether I'm reading it or hundred percent. I don't think it's cheating. I mean, if you're not one for reading, for mm-hmm. sure. Go the audiobook route. What are some what are some must reads for Houndsman? What do you what what will be your list? Uh, I mean, walk with Wick. If you're just wanting like real like information, like not a whole lot of stories, just like real information. I think Walk with Wick is one of the best ones for that. Mm-hmm. Uh like there's two, isn't there? Yeah. Volume one and volume two. Yeah. I don't think I've read volume two. Got volume one. Uh, slash ranch hand mm-hmm. hounds is good. Uh, meet Mr. Grizzly. That's a that's a good one. That's a cool one. I mean, this guy was Montague Stevens. Yeah, this guy was. Uh, <clears throat> and if you're a hog hunter. You're really going to like meet Mr. Grizzly because Montague Stevens was hunting grizzly bears with mutts the way that we hog hunt. Like he was banging them up and then sending in catch dogs. Mm -hmm. And through the book, he's going through, you know, he tries a a number of purebred catch dogs and crossbred catch dogs and He's a really smart, you can tell he's a really smart dude. He's an Englishman, but he lives in America. But yeah, that's a good one. Uh, I mean, those would probably be my top three, I think. There's a bunch. I mean, there's a bunch, though. Yeah. Pretty much everybody knows about those, I think. Mm-hmm. Well, one thing that's that I'm always looking for, and I think everybody should, if you're ever at garage sales, and you, even if you're not a reader, like go through the books because I was talking with uh, a friend of mine, Chester Palmer. He's an older guy. Maybe a couple years ago we were talking about it, but he had he had brought me some books to look at. I couldn't have them, but I could look at them. So there was like, and there was this, there was this time probably. I think most of it was it was probably like early to mid to late 80s and i don't know what made it happen but so during that time frame it was just kind of this deal where like old old houndsmen so like if you were 65 plus in the mid 80s and you kind of knew your shit and you had the inclination those guys would write these books yeah and sometimes they would be small you know, some of them were 350 pages. Some of them were 70 pages. But these guys would just, you know, self-publish. So, you know, they might get 100 copies printed or they might get 1,000 copies printed. And then for the most part, when those when they'd sold all those books, they were gone. Right. And there are a ton of those books out there. They're hard to find. Guy Ormiston has a book like that. You know, breeding, breeding and... Was, yeah, breeding working dog on breeding working dogs. Yeah. Guy Ormiston, have you do you know who he is? Uh uh-uh. He used to write a uh, he used to write an article for Coonham Bloodlines that goes across Washita and um from Oklahoma? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. I'm pretty sure a guy is from Oklahoma. Well, but he Washington. was way ahead of his time on on genetics and and he's a historian. He's he's heavy, really heavy in the blue tick breed, but but his concepts and the things he writes about transcend, you know, breed boundaries and all that stuff. But but uh, Guy Ormiston is one that one like you talked about. Another one is Del Cameron, Call of the Hounds, who yeah, had his. Yeah. Th- that's an outstanding book. Yeah, a lot of people question the. Um, the validity of it, but you know, you got to give the authors some license. They took the gumption to write the book, you know, do your own research and sort it out. If, if you, if you got doubts, 
Yeah. I, th- I think it's just a great book. And then uh, some newcomers that are on the scene. Kevin Hall wrote that book, and and I was fortunate to be to be able to write the forward for that book. But I got to read the I got to read the manuscript on it before it was finished, and his ability to it's the most interest it's the most interesting book that i've ever read in the style what's it called tracking the long walker and it's about a mountain lion that and he uses the mountain lion it's it's it comes just short of anthropomorphism you know where he's he's given but this lion witnesses all these events that happen in the west uh but there's they're all real stories with that kevin or people that kevin knows have been involved in you know losing hounds a, a hound that was lost for um months that that survived and the way they tracked her and i mean it's just it's it's brilliantly put together and extremely so like, entertaining so it's like historical fiction and the narrator is yeah. a mountain lion yeah kind of a little bit that's that's cool yeah it's it like you know he's watching he he witnesses a murder that happened in the mountains and then and then people that were in the area you know they started a mountain line track just up the area from where this the body was located and stuff you know so it's a it's a creative spin it's pretty cool it's real cool yeah, yeah. and then uh we just featured uh tl jones with his old men book and i mean that's about barry tarleton and terry jones and a lot of other bear hunters from green you know the greenville tennessee area and a lot of those life lessons and different things that that were incorporated into into that book that's a pretty cool book too and it's if anybody's looking for an easy read that's one because you can really each segment of that book, I haven't read one. There isn't any segment that's more than three pages long that tells a complete story, shells it right down to the cob, gets down to the point, and you move on to the next one. Yeah, and they probably all stand. Can What's stand that? Separate. They can probably all stand separate. Yeah, yeah. So if you come, if you come back three weeks later, you don't have to try to remember where you were at. Nope. You know? Nope. Yeah, I mean, I like, I like, uh, I like books like that that tell hunting stories but uh i really like the books that like give some useful information maybe yeah those are a little bit harder to come by i think well i, I i'll just say it i mean this is raw dog and we, we're uncensored and we'll say what we what's on our mind but the hound hunting community needs to read more they need to read more they need to educate themselves that's why we're getting kicked in the nuts all the time because you know we just were not well read i posted a i saw a cartoon meme i hate using that word but it's floating around on social media about a guy standing at a counter he says here i'm here to buy permission to feed my family and in the background says hunting license sold here and i saw a bunch of hunters sharing that and you know, in the most simplistic terms to look at that. I mean, when I first looked at it, I thought, yeah, you know, you're buying permission to feed your family. But when you, when you, you look at just below the surface of that and you've got to recognize that that's way too simplistic. You can't look at it like that. Um, those hunting license and the way that those hunting license sales generate money back to the states for management in Pittman Robertson dollars. I mean, we've we've generated twenty-five billion dollars since the creation of the Pittman Robertson Fund. And that's the reason why we still have a seat at the table on wildlife management issues. That's why we still have influence. No state wants to lose that Pittman Robertson money. Well, and federal money or what? It's federal money. 
1937, there was a the Wildlife Restoration Act was passed in U.S. Congress and put a tax on on firearms and ammunition later to include archery equipment, stuff like that. But it, it was called the Wildlife Restoration Act. And for every every rifle and, and bullet to sold, sportsmen stepped up and said, we'll pay the tax, restore the wildlife. And so they volunteered and they approved, they was overwhelmingly supported that, that yes, pay, we want to pay the extra tax. And then that money is divvied up based on the number of license each state sells back to that state for wildlife restoration projects. Doesn't go to pay salaries. It doesn't go to for any of that stuff. It's, it's for wildlife habitat improvement and restoration projects. Yeah. And over the years we've, we've, and that includes, that includes, you know, funding studies for wildlife in Oklahoma to mountain lion studies in the Rocky Mountains to bear studies in Appalachia to quail studies and pheasant studies in, in the Dakotas, you know, $25 like billion, a, it, billion. dollars. It's a cultural thing, you know, and and I, w- I wouldn't get mad at anybody for commenting on something like that, like, a, you know, but that was true or whatever, because it's like a it's a cultural thing. I mean, we talked about that a long time ago, but. <clears throat> and it varies state to state, but you know, in Oklahoma, our wildlife department, we have we have a ton of public hunting, mm-hmm. and and that the vast majority of that, maybe not the I shouldn't say that, maybe not the majority, but a big part of that is the wildlife department and the state of Oklahoma taking money. The hunters have bought in tags and licenses and fines. Can't leave those out. <laughs> there aren't many. I, I'll bet you there aren't very there there aren't very many dollars in fines that go back fines. to state of Oklahoma. Yeah, but I mean they take that money and they'll, uh, you know, they buy plots of land. You know, they what? got oh, they buy, buy plots? plots of land. Mm-hmm. We're like we'll have a a WMA and they'll be you know. 660 acres next to it and the guy who owns it is 85 years old and they'll go to him and be like hey we want to buy that and connect it onto this and they're sure. doing that con- yep. they're doing that constantly mm-hmm. and that's why i say it's a culture thing i mean we kind of i mean we can't i mean like we said it's a cat and mouse game we're gonna have our little tips and everything but for the most part i mean i mean if you take that out of the equation and you don't have private land to hunt you would just be out of the game you know, but if you don't have do, what, if you take out the money that we paid in and licenses and mm-hmm. we, and you know, tax on sporting good stuff and, and fines and all that, that doesn't give the wildlife department money to go buy those lands. We wouldn't have very many lands. Right. For just not only, general, not only to buy them, but to manage them, you know, to be able that, to manage them. They don't manage ours very well. <laughs> They're probably doing the best they can. I, I don't know. I don't want to sound like the cheerleader for, I don't know what goes on in Oklahoma. I mean, we got some roads that I swear they just, they won't fix because they know if they fix them, people will go hunting. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not even joking. I'm like, I'm. <laughs> well, we've had, list- we've had stuff. We've had roads shut down in the state of Indiana too. I'm not, you know, and who's your national and stuff. Yeah. I mean, anybody who's listening, who's from Northeast Oklahoma, that's ever hunted uh Cherokee WMA, they know that. Yeah. And granted they're hard roads to maintain, but when you it's what uh we didn't buy that land. I know I bought it for like pennies, but it was a big uh POW camp back in World War Two that that crossed two counties. It sat on the the center line of two counties. And uh at some point thereafter, they gave the Cherokee County side to the wildlife department, turned it into a public hunt, and, and the roads are horrendous. Like you better have, you better not go in your like your driveway. Oh, uh, way worse. Like you gotta have real. <laughs> you know, you don't go there without a real four wheel drive, a winch on your truck, come along chains. I mean, you know, and then you cross the county line on to the Camp Cribber side, the Muscogee County side, and the National Guard has those roads just like you can cruise 45 yeah. miles an hour on them those roads. 
But it's easy to bitch about stuff. Sure. Well, my my whole point is is it's like don't buy don't buy into that crap. If if the anti hunters can defund, if they can convince all of us to stop buying license, if they can convince, then then that shuts down Pittman Robertson funds. I'm telling you this 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 game we are trying to play that we're trying to combat this these enemies we are so sophisticated and so forward thinking that they are not above doing disinformation campaigns to plant the seeds that your state fish and wildlife agency is just the tax man trying to take your money and if it if if we can get enough people on board to say that and say hey we're not buying hunt license anymore then you shut down a valuable part of that. You take you take billions of dollars off the table, and then we lose our seat. We lose our opportunity to have a say. And we we got to maintain that because because if you're buying a license to hunt, you're doing a huge service for hunting. You're doing you're you're. If you stop doing that, you're sure as heck not going to show up at a meeting to stand up for your rights. When you buy your license, you're standing up and saying, hey, I'm I'm supporting this. I'm participating in this. This is my wildlife. I paid for it. And, and if it's got to be Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation or it's got to be Safari Club International or it's got to be whoever that goes and represents you, they're representing you because – you paid for the license you're you're recognized as a hunter but if it's just left up to us individuals man i'm gonna tell you right now we are screwed nobody's gonna show up and you know this ed because you work with the oklahoma dog hunters association how many of you guys show up uh not very many but i mean not not very many when everything's going good when when things are going bad we have a decent amount of people show up but like Kind of percentage on, wise what's your estimate percentage wise percentage how many of, how many dog, dog hunters, hunters you think are in oklahoma and if you've got a call to action at state capital how many people show up oh gosh i mean i would just be throwing numbers out on the one side but i would say there's probably half a million people in oklahoma that hunt with a dog bunch of those are probably not hardcore dog hunters hardcore dog hunters maybe a hundred thousand mm-hmm. maybe 100, 150 and in years and we've had bad stuff going and and we do it exactly with to quote have you, ever, I mean, have you ever had fifteen thousand people show up oh no i mean we that's we, not even ten percent i mean we have like 15 people show up exactly one percent not even one percent. Would that be point point zero point zero one percent? It might be two point, zeros. Fifty uh, hundred fifty thousand. Ten percent would be fifteen thousand. Mm hmm. Fifteen hundred maybe one percent. Fifteen hundred be one percent. One hundred and fifty would be point zero one percent. Fifteen would be zero zero one percent. Point zero zero one percent people show up yeah and that's obviously you know that's just guessing at numbers right but like the way they do it in oklahoma that's on the legislative side of it so in oklahoma we have a uh, fishing game commission which i believe is it's either five or seven i can't remember it's either five or seven guys so so if fishing game decides that they want to do whatever they want to shrink rabbit season by month they have a commission meeting public's welcome and then they kind of uh, throw it out there they do their lobbying behind the scenes and then the commissioners get to the vote on it so years ago we had uh ed abel uh, yep. black and tan man, man right he was on the commission board of commissioners so we had a dog hunter up there he's been gone for a number of years 
And so now, I mean, now it's just like it, the governor appoints people to that uh, committee commission. And, and the last, the last meeting I was at, they had some woman who was a new commissioner, nothing against women, but you know, she was brand new. So she has to get up and give this little speech about how <laughs> her dad used to hunt. And I really like to shoot guns every once in a while. It's like, but that's what I'm getting at. Like all these people, or no, I shouldn't say all these people. At least half these people up on this wildlife commission committee are not even hunters, you know? So I started asking around and I was like, you know, what do we have to do to get, you know, a dog hunter on this committee? And Ed Barnes, the started, wildlife commissioner. I would do it. You can, it's a paid position. Yeah. And you meet, you meet like maybe six times a year, I think. Uh, but, uh, so I started asking around to some politicians and they're like, well, you got to donate. They said at least $250,000 every time the governor is up for reelection, just to be, have, just to even, then he's got to win. Then somebody's got to step down from the board. There has to be an opening. And they're like, unless you're, unless you've been this solid contributor, you're not even on the list. And they're like, you could spend over six years. You could spend a million and a half dollars. That doesn't guarantee you're going to get that appointment. You got it. You've got it, Ed. You can do it. I've got what? The million and a half. Just go ahead and oh, yell it out. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Then we just got to <laughs> knock off one of the commissioners. <laughs> we need like uh, a dog hunt. We like a dog hunting mafia that does that kind of <laughs> shit. Uh, I'm <laughs> <laughs> blackmail uh, the go blackmail the governor. We could steal the steal the governor's do wife's dog or the governor's husband's dog and hold it for ransom. Yeah, or like. Godfather and like cut off its head and throw it in his bed. Oh, geez, oh, <laughs> <laughs> we are going to get shut down. We're going to have the, the freaking FBI pounding on our doors. But, you know, I mean, that's how that shit works. I mean, which, not like which state just there was a state that passed. And uh, listeners, help us out here. If you know what the state this is, let us know. But in order to be on the Wildlife Commission, you had to have a valid hunting license within the previous three years or three out of the five last the last five years or something like that it seemed like that was it's got to be it's well, i would say yeah i would say that's the bare minimum yeah yeah you know? yeah i mean how are you gonna i mean you know how are you gonna have a you know that's like even an understanding know. of what the hell's going on it'd be like it would be like me trying to make decisions on parking for the Indianapolis 500 from Bear Branch, Indiana. I've yeah, never, I, mean, I, I don't have a clue. I've got nothing invested in this. I have no understanding of what goes on in, in Speedway the week of the Indy 500. I have no clue. So why am I making decisions about it? That's the way that works. Like on the federal level, like, uh, I think it was a year ago, maybe two years ago. Like they had, they appointed Congress appointed a committee, you know, to look into uh, legislation concerning artificial intelligence. And I saw the list of people on the committee. Mm -hmm. uh, Pelosi was one of them. Oh, I mean, yeah. the bag oh. is like 94 years old or something. Right. But like the average age on that committee to, to think about artificial intelligence was like they, it, the average age had to be like in their mid 70s. And it's like, what, you know, we got to put people in these positions that that have some knowledge of what what they're supposed to be. Voting on, controlling, legislating, you know, it's ridiculous. Yeah, 55, this this 
background you see right here, I created on artificial intelligence, AI. And I yeah. think it was meta AI that did it, but I have no freaking clue. It scares, it, AI scares me. It's, it's from the devil for sure. It doesn't scare me. I mean, <laughs> uh, that's a joke. We already had this well, conversation. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I read something a few months ago, and it, and I don't remember it exactly, but they were, you know, they were talking about, you know, whenever telephones first came out, that there was, you know, a bunch of middle aged people who were like, oh my gosh, this is going to end yeah. the world, and it, and they they kind of like cited some kind of loose references, but like anytime there's a new technology that it scares some people, AI does have the ability to be some some bad shit. Uh, it's really not the it's really not the technology it's who uses it like so the ai that they have access to like in china like this is where it gets scary it's i'm not scared that you know ai is gonna build robots that kill humans i'm scared of humans not uh computers but so like in china the government is controlling the ai that people have access to so they're tr they're training it. Mm -hmm. So in China, if you go in and type in, you know, is China a good place to live? What do you think it's going to tell you? You think it's going to tell you the truth, or you think it's, it's an going enchanting to tell you place? If you can yeah. walking through the tea gardens of East, you yeah, know, the, blah blah the blah. Greatest, yeah, the greatest place on earth, you know. Yeah. So it's it's a means for humans to manipulate manipulate humans. I'm not afraid of robots or computers taking over humans but so like when ai was when that chat gbt was fairly new and i was thinking kind of a, in that same vein so then i went on there and typed in like explain hog hunting with dogs and i totally 100 percent was like just waiting for the it's a cruel vicious you know barbaric you know sport kin to dog fighting and i was like blown away like it came it wrote like two three four paragraphs like detailing like how to hog hunt with dogs and there was no negative there was no negative slant at all totally blew, mm. me, blew me away totally objective it really was really? that doesn't mean it will stay that way mm -hmm. but, why do you think why do you think that was possible though what how do you think because ai needs information in order to generate information so yeah they, I mean, really, they, they take yeah. bits of information and then quantify it to develop answers to questions they'll take a piece from ed barnes they'll take a piece from chris powell they'll take a piece from you know tanner her or whoever and put yeah. all these bits of information, all the stuff that's floating around out there on the internet to develop their answer from Mike Colley, from, you know, all these hog hunters. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't, I don't have the answer for that. I don't know, but I mean, AI I can only be as smart as what you, the information that you feed it, you know? So if you get a government entity or, or even, you know, private, entities like meta or whatever that that have aspirations for power they can change ai's knowledge quote knowledge of the world by what they allow it to see which then in chain in in turn years down the road affects the way people think about things so it's powerful it's super powerful but I don't think you should be scared of it. You should just be. All right. Scared. So I just, I'm just going to go right off of the, while we were talking, I went into meta, which run, owns Facebook and Instagram. And I typed in explain hunting mountain lions with hounds. And I'm just going to read it. Cause it's not that long. I'll just read what it says. Hunting mountain lions with hounds, also known as hound hunting or lion hunting is a type of hunting that involves using trained dogs to track and locate mountain lions, also known as cougars or pumas. Here's a general overview of the process. 
One, preparation. Hunters prepare their hounds, usually a pack of four to six dogs, by training them to track and follow the scent of mountain lions. Two, locating a lion. Hunters use various methods to locate mountain lion, such as tracking, scouting, or using trail cameras. Three, releasing the hounds. Once a lion is located, the hunters release the hounds, which follow the lion's scent. Four, the chase. The hounds pursue the mountain lion, barking and howling to alert the hunters. Five, treeing. The mountain lion often climbs a tree to escape the hounds. Hunters then locate the tree and approach the lion. Six, this is interesting, harvesting. It's interesting that they picked that word, harvesting. I if hate the hunter, that word. But it's interesting that they picked it. If the hunter decides to harvest the lion, they will shoot it from a safe distance to avoid harming the hounds. Seven, recovery. After the hunt, the hunters recover the lion and the hounds, and the process is complete. Please note that regulations and laws regarding mountain lion hunting vary by state and region, and not all states allow hunting with hounds. Additionally, the ethics and controversial aspect of this type of hunting are debated among hunters. And this is a, this is the word I hate: conservationists and animal welfare advocates. So, but yeah, that's a pretty good, you know. That was that was pretty against. daggone. No, it wasn't slanted at all. Harvesting. You hate that word. That's a farmer's word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hate You're that. You're darn right. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, we kill shit. <laughs> we, have, we have picked up that word to appease a, people. Yeah. It's a defense mechanism. Yes. And I, it, and I, I, I I'm a strong advocate of like saying what you mean or mean what you say and say what you mean. Yeah. Just say it. Like, yeah, we're hunters. We kill shit, you know? Yeah. I harvest in my garden and when I'm in the woods, I shoot stuff and I'm not apologetic about it. I don't need to baby my language down so I don't hurt somebody's feelings. Uh, if you're a grown person and you can't deal with that, then just stay away from it. I, th I thought it was interesting. Harvesting, if the hunter decides to harvest the lion. Yeah, that was good. That was pretty dang good. If that, that goes in our favor as, as hunters, if we decide. So that's leaving it open that if we decide that, nah, this isn't a lion we want to take, we can, we can actually gather our hounds and, and walk away. Yeah, you can't do that with poison. You can't do that with traps. To an extent, you can do it with a gun, but some, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you don't really know what you got till it's dead right. and you're looking at it. But like in hound hunting, we have the ability most of the time to to back off or you know go forward. That was pretty daggone interesting, right there. That it came up with all that information, and I think AI has to have been you know tapping into all these different things. And I think so many times we think that we're being overpowered by the anti-hunting narrative that I was expecting it's a barbarian type thing, yeah, that, yeah. you know, knuckle draggers do, and they turn loose these vicious hounds to, to corner these helpless lions. And because that's what we're, that's the narrative we're told all the time is that, that we're being beat, we're being outgamed, we're, I'm guilty of it. And, and getting trapped in that. But when I see this, AI had to go through and find an objective answer to all this stuff to be able to put together an answer like this, which means yeah, that, that, that good people are putting good information out there about lion hunting. Yeah, and, and that, that concept plays out not just in hunting or dog hunting or lion hunting or hog hunting. It's like in all aspects of politics, I mean, you go back, you know, I don't want to get real political, but like you go back to like Trump's victory in 16, you know, do you remember how that shocked everybody? It shocked me. Like I was on his side and it shocked me. I voted for Biden. 
in 2016? <laughs> no, I voted. I voted for Hillary. Yeah, I'm sure you did. <laughs> and <laughs> you were driving a Subaru back then. <laughs> but uh, hey, Mark Dufresne, that. Mark Dufresne drove all the way to Woodbury, Kentucky, from Maine. He's sleeping in a freaking hammock down there, building a flintlock rifle right now. And I looked at his car. Mark Dufresne drove a Subaru from Maine. They're not, they're not bad cars. They're great cars. And they're made in Indiana and are refused to let the liberal lesbians hijack an Indiana made car. But back to 16. Forget <laughs> Subarus. Uh, you know, I'll never forget that night because I remember I stayed up most of the night. I did just too. Watching the news and it was just. I think what drew me in was just that everybody was so shocked. I, like I say, I was shocked too. They were more shocked than I was. Yep. But where, where we that coon come? hunting? It was November 8th. It was opening on to coon season. November, November 3rd. 8th. November huh? 3rd. Should have been November 3rd, wasn't it? November. No, in 2016, it was because oh, yeah, we yeah. were watching it while we were between trees and stuff. We were looking at our phones on the results and Donnie Walston and, and Ken Cohn and I were hunting together and we're like, Holy crap, they're going to do it. My daughter's messaging me, send me texts. It's like, I think he's going to do it. He's going to yeah. do it. Yeah, it was awesome. But, but I, mean, I bring that up not to talk about Trump, but to talk about the bigger issue that, like, so why did that shock everybody? That shocked everybody the same. It's, 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 it's the same thing you were talking about. So I always say, like, if aliens showed up tonight and just like, found a TV and just like started watching TV to get a grip of, you know, what Americans were like before they made their move or whatever. They would think we were all gay, left-handed, you know. You watch TV and we're just like over, we take the fringe part of our society and we give it so much publicity and push it so far out front that even as you know a red-blooded american you watch that for so long and you start thinking mm -hmm. it, it gets in your head like i'm a minority i'm i'm not really part of the majority anymore this fringe crazy extremist people right or left are the majority but they're not like the majority is still just common sense good people you know, mm -hmm. and I think do you we think that trans that. do you think that transcends cultures? Do you think that applies to every culture of human beings? You, when you say culture, you mean like inside of America or outside of America or worldwide human humankind? Do you think that's? Do you think most people? I mean, if you if you landed in a village in Europe, Uruguay, or wherever. You know, that people that were living in grass huts somewhere. I don't even know where Uruguay is. I don't know why I picked that, but um, South America. Yeah, South America. You know, do I you don't know. I don't know. People are people, though, aren't they? I think people are mostly good. You've lived in Africa. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, though. Like when you, even when you put really good people in really, really hard situations just to, survive they'll do some bad shit just to keep them and them, their kids alive which i really wouldn't say is bad you know quote bad but it might be read as bad i think people are mostly good when we when we we're in desert storm after the war we had to hang out and um, we were tasked with training saudi troops and um that was an, probably the most eye-opening experience that I had through the whole war because we had kids that were, that were, you know, sons of Saudi princes because they're required to have do their, their military service. And then we had kids that were from the Bedouin, the Bedouin culture. You know, just farm kids, country kids. And and I saw the difference. I saw the difference. It was like it's just like in our culture, city kids versus country kids. I was I was drawn to the to the country kids that understood that 
if you can't be sneaky in a Saudi Arabian desert or something, I mean, you got you got real issues. You don't give a you don't give a crap about anything. Yeah. But we would have to tell these city kids not to step on the plant vegetation because they didn't care. Whereas these country kids, they'd been out, you know, taking care of sheep and trying to f- round up a, a lost goat or something and knew that they needed to walk around the bush and, and have a more conversations with them. They're not wired much different than what I was. Yeah. That's like in that, in that book we were talking about that demon copperhead in that book, he's, he's a hit kid. And at one point he, he goes to like a school in the, not like a big city, but a bigger city. And uh, like I say, he was in foster care. So, and a lot of these foster homes, they like worked him like a dog. Like he had to, he was he worked on a, a ranch for a while, and they just the old guy who owned it just like used him and three other foster kids as like forced labor. You know, he's like eight years old, mm-hmm. and then so he had a series of. I mean, he he worked his butt off, and it, and that whole book is is written in first person, so it's just him telling the story his viewpoint but uh, when he goes to this like school in the city he's like man these kids are you know these kids are soft they're, they're kind of yeah. fat and they don't know anything and he's like you can tell he's like <laughs> he's like they don't know the value of a dollar bill he's like because they don't know you know they never takes, had to earn it yeah he's like they don't know that it takes two and a half hours to make a ten dollar bill hard work and he just goes on and on it just it plays into exactly what you're saying like country kids just kind of have more of a real I, th- I think a more real outlook on life like you know like you know i'll be talking to people and they're like i have kids that are like 10 years old and and their dog dies and they're like trying to come up with lies to tell the kid what happened to the dog without having to tell them that it died you know, and country kids are not like that. No, you know, they they understand the whole process of life, and they come to terms pretty quick with death of animals. Man, there's a lot. You, there's a lot to unpack with that right there. Did you did you give pay your kids an allowance? No. Uh-uh. Yeah, and that's we did. We never did either. It's like. Your allowances, food, clothes, you know, they had they had luxury items too. It's us running you to to baseball, you know, things like that. Yeah. But um you don't ah, that whole allowance deal, it's like you're just paying a kid for being alive. And that's created a lot of the problems we have. But then um so I've never, we've never been that type. And then my son told me probably it's been less than three to six months ago. He's 22 years old. He's been working in a machine shop. I'm going to brag on my kid here a little bit, but, uh, been working in a machine shop since he graduated from high school and he owns his own home at 22 years old. That's pretty good. Yeah. And I'm just like, holy crap. I didn't do that. I never did that. And he told me, he's like, Hey, I just want to let you know that I'm glad you taught me stuff because I, I, think, I just teaching him stuff, just that you can do this. You can figure this out. Yeah. I think allowance can go both ways. Like when I was a kid, I got an allowance. I got $2 a week. It wasn't just, <laughs> it, it wasn't automatic. Right. You know, yeah. I did have, I did have to do stuff to get it. And there was weeks when I wouldn't get it. So I understand. <laughs> I understand both so sides you you had a value system a, a, attached to that. Yeah, so I knew like so when I went to the so yeah, so I knew I got $2 a week. So if I went to the store, I didn't spend quite as freely cuz I was like I understood the value of that money. Yeah, there's not going to be $2 until next week. What am I going to yeah. do between now and then? Or if I I you know, I learned I think the biggest uh I'm a big proponent of delayed gratification. I think I learned that uh, from a 
young age. So it was like, yeah, I could buy this right now, but if I don't buy anything for the next six weeks, then I can buy this big thing, you know? So I, I, I'm not, I'm not anti allowance. I mean, I think it teaches money management and the value of money. I think it's not a, it's not a kid problem. It's a parenting problem. I think you can use it. I mean, withholding the kid's allowance gives you an opportunity to teach them a lot of things. So I'm with you. I'm not against allowance. We just didn't have money to pay kids for doing stuff. They had a book barn full of goats and they had 4-H hogs and and doing different stuff. And that's your allowance is going to come when you take care of this animal and you sell it at market then you're going to see that you're going to see the benefits of your labor. And if you get a three or $400 check or 600, whatever, that was their money. We'll put it in accounts for them. If you decide that you're going to spend all of it the day after you get it, you're going to have to hold, work a whole year and you're not going to have any money until next year yeah. until you raise the next one. I don't know. That's just the way we operate it. Yeah. And that's, you know, money management, is something that has to be taught at home because schools do not teach it at all. Not at all. Like they don't even, I mean, they don't even touch on it. Like when I, I'm sure you probably did. Like when I was, so when I was in a seventh grade, we, it was mandatory. Like, uh, for the boys, we did one semester of shop, which we all loved. But then it was, oh, goodness, next semester, we got to do home ec. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> and and home, ec, home ec was cooking and sewing and money management to a degree. I mean, it didn't get super in-depth, but we did talk about it. Budgeting. But we talked about budgeting yep. and, like, the cost of cooking meals and stuff like that. Yep. And I don't think they do any of that anymore. I don't think they do either. I haven't checked in, but. And I, yeah. you know, like I say, I hate, I hated that when it was like, oh shit, like, you know, you come back from Christmas break or whatever, and it's like, oh, I gotta go to home ec, and I hated it at the time, but honest to goodness, like it taught me how to like sew, and yeah, and now you're making knife sheets. Yeah, but I mean, even before that, like I always uh, like to sew my. Cause I'm cheap. So, <laughs> <laughs> so when I blow out my pants, so they don't just go in the trash. I try to sew them first. And I learned exactly. how to do that. In, I learned how to do that in home ec. Yep. I'm with you, man. I like the whole, I posted a, I, I got to go to Woodbury, Kentucky. And uh, there's a school down there. This is a whole different podcast. We'll cover this later. Not really because it all ties in. I've been, I've been waiting to throw that out there, but we get sidetracked, but like we were talking about Appalachia and it ties totally into that. Yeah. So there's this Woodbury, Kentucky is, is, uh, down towards Bowling Green. It's considered Western Kentucky, but Herschel house was a, um, leg was a legendary rifle builder, flintlock rifles. That's all he built. Don't call him to build you a cap lock or a Hawken or anything like that. He's going to build you, um, uh, a very good replica of an early mountain rifle that was used in what is considered the middle ground of Kentucky, Northern Tennessee, you know, this whole area back like in the what, 18th, 18th century. So what like time frame are you talking about? 17, 1750 to no later than 1812. Yeah. You know, and, and Herschel, you can't touch a Herschel rifle that I know of for less than 15 grand. Um, he was featured in Foxfire five. He was a master blacksmith. He could build, he could build, he could make knives. He could, he could blacksmith. He, when you walk around his place and you look at the hinges on all the doors and everything, they were all blacksmithed right there on the place. He's got a double A nineteen twenty seven double A Ford truck that that he could keep running. Uh, I mean, he's just very pragmatic person 
that had developed a, a really devoted following over the years. How, and what, do you know how old he was or what year he was born? He died at, he died in January and I believe Herschel was 83 years old. So 24, what is that? The forties. He'd have been like 1940, you know, in the forties. Yeah. Yeah. He was a Vietnam veteran. He'd served in the United States Marine Corps, uh, came home and, and, um, uh, just set up shop and started pounding iron and his brother, two brothers are also involved in that. Um, but I mean, this guy, the reason, the reason the books and all this other stuff, when you go in Herschel's house, his shelves are full of books and he read, he didn't have, I never even found Herschel on social media until probably the last five years. And he was, he was just trying to set up his legacy and before his death this past and i don't want to tell this whole story because i'm actually going to go back down and record a whole podcast about it but very well read very um pragmatic about things build his own cabins build his you know his own shops when you walk around his place there's a there's probably 12 different workstations there. This is how forward thinking he was. He would invite people in and, and show them how to do stuff. And he always called them, you know, friends. These our friends are here working this weekend. And when you walk around his place, there's probably 12 different stations and each station has a, has a post vice, a bench, a forge, and adequate lighting you know you're expected to bring the rest of your stuff whether you're going to build a knife that weekend you're going to build a tomahawk you're going to build a you know take several days and a few days and build a rifle and and every part of that he could do it all he could he could he could start with iron and turn out a flintlock rifle you know for for time's sake for time's sake he would iron and wood and turn out a flintlock rifle and for time's sake he used he used davis a lot of davis barrels and davis triggers and stuff like that davis locks but he could do it all he could i watched i've, I've seen videos and and of them lap welding and making a a barrel for a flintlock rifle out of a piece of flat iron yeah yeah we were talking about that and like i didn't know uh, I was just introduced to him a few years ago, not personally, but uh, I don't know if it was him or or what. But there was there was a Herschel House Facebook group, mm-hmm. and uh, Pat added me to it, and that was the first time I'd heard of him. And I don't know a whole lot about him, but that's why I was asking you how old he was because I would have. I would have assumed that he was from an earlier time than that. Like I would have thought that he was probably born in like the 19 teens and that he had all this information out of necessity. Mm -hmm. But if he was born in the forties, then he has all this knowledge because it was like a passion of his and he went and found it, you know? Yep. Yeah, he grew up in that, that. We were kind of talking about that this past weekend. This past weekend, when I drove down there, the, the reason I drove down, I've been to Woodbury several times. I've been to Herschel's place. I've never been there for any kind of school or anything like that. But, but Herschel was a type of guy. You know, they, he and his family consulted on movies like The Patriot with Mel Gibson and. His brother Frank's actually in the movie. They set up the Contemporary Long Rifle Association kind of together. Um, and I don't, I don't want to speak out of school here, but they were involved heavily in this type of historical preservation. I think is the best way you could put it: the historical preservation of that time. And he built rifles for Fess Parker that played Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett. 
there's pictures of him and Fess in the house. And um, Mel Gibson, the tomahawk that Mel Gibson, you know, he, he picks up. And that was either made by John or Frank House, his brothers. That's and cool. and um, I don't know who built the rifles that, that Mel Gibson carried in the Patriot, but was one of the houses. Uh, Frank was the uh, quartermaster, or no, he was a firearms instructor for the, on the movie set for that. And, you know, I mean, there's just people want to, to preserve that sort of stuff. And now since his death, he was forward thinking enough and he set up a foundation called the Herschel House Woodbury School Foundation. And, and they're trying to make a go of it and continue the classes and things like that. Yeah, you brought up the Foxfire books, and uh, since we've talked a lot about reading the books in this episode, they do have. He's he is in one of those books. I can't remember what volume. But if anybody's, look, I, I think it's Foxfire Five. But that's, yeah. if anybody's you know interested in like just kind of old school stuff, like look up the Foxfire books. Like you can. I don't know about now. I mean, I bought, I pieced my, I pieced my uh, collection together years ago, just at thrift stores and mm -hmm. flea markets. I bought most of them for twenty five cents. Yeah, but there's, uh, what is there like? I don't even remember. Is there like ten or eleven in the series? It's up there. It's a big series. Is there that many now? There may not be. Maybe it's seven. I can't remember. I'd have to go look look it up but it's a huge collection of books that just have like old school knowledge and, and me and chris were talking about this on the phone the other day not not the foxfire books but this in general that people from an earlier time chris who weren't me and weren't you? So, yeah oh, okay that, that people weren't so specialized like today now somebody like knows every last thing about you know, a computer. They can build a computer from the ground up, but they can't build a chair. Yeah. You know. But you go back to earlier generations, those guys knew how to do everything. They weren't a master at everything, but they could build a chair. They could forge a knife. They could build a house. You know, they had to know a huge variety of skills, and that's kind of lost today. But the Foxfire books... If I'm not mistaken, it started out. It's from well, Boone, North Carolina, the university. Yeah, that, yeah. Appalachian it, State University. But didn't it start out? I could be. I could be making this up, but I think it was like a high school teacher like gave her kids an assignment to go like talk to one of their grandparents about an old skill. I'm and pretty sure it, it it all came from the college level. Was it college these, level? Yeah, out of Boone, North Carolina, Appalachian State. Yeah, but it's a huge resource. If you're into, you know, living off the land or just being more self-sufficient or just learning old skills that are kind of lost, like I said, be it building a chair, building a rifle, bear hunting, planting a garden. Well, that's where I got my – I used to – when I was a kid, I read the Foxfire books, and I still remember the picture – of a plot dog on a bear and this plot yeah. dog had a big white patch on his chest and they interviewed um all these legendary plot guys that that were involved and i'm gonna have to go back and reread it now but um like potterfield and uh, just a bunch of guys that were that were involved in, in the culture of bear hunting and some guys that we've never heard of too. So it's, that's what got me started on this road. Wild dogs. Yeah. Um, not only that, but just Appalachian bear hunting, everything from shingle making to gardening, to canning, to, you know, which like which firewoods burn hotter in yeah. a wood stove. Yeah. It's amazing. What, what's in there. I yeah, it's crazy. It's a if I had to just like keep a few books, they, it would it would they would probably be the books I kept. 
just because there's so much information in there. And there's, they talk about dog horns in there, making dog yep. horns. Yep. I mean, pretty much tan and leather, tan and leather, you know, blacksmith and art, picking up iron in the mountains and, and bringing it down and rendering it down, building an outhouse, you know, yeah. it was like the original survivor series, you know, <laughs> yeah. Hillbilly edition. Yeah. I think that was like, was that in the sixties or seventies? I think it started in the sixties. Yeah. But, yeah, great, great series of books. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, I'll tell you what, man. I don't know how long we've been going. We haven't talked a whole lot about dogs, but we've talked about life. Yeah, it ain't all going to be about dogs. No. I mean, this this is like beyond the, the dog hunting stuff. This is the interesting stuff. Yeah. But um, you need to come up. I'm, I'm going to get you some links. I, how far is it from Owensboro, Kentucky to your house? Owen, was that like six hours? Owensburg, Kentucky? Owensboro. Owensboro? Yeah. I'm Googling right now. Holy crap. That's a haul for you. Nine, nine hours, hours and 40, nine hours and 42 minutes is what I got. Yeah, it's straight nine hours from right where I'm at. Yep. I mean, I've driven further. Oh. And the thing about it is, it's like when I got there, this was a paid class. Mark Dufresne was posting stuff. I was like, are you in Woodbury? He's like, yeah, I'm in Woodbury right now. So well, I'm driving down there tomorrow. It's only three hours from my house. So I drove down and I walked in the driveway of Herschel's place and I knew they had a paid school going on. And the guy that was running it there, he was just like, come on in. They're all down there at the shop. You know, I said, I'm not trespassing. Am I? He's like, heck no. We got people coming in here all the time. Everybody's working at the workstations and stuff. And John house is standing there at the forge. And he's, I watched him forge, butt plates, two piece, butt plates, trigger guards. He was just, and everything's a coal fired, coal fire forge. Yeah. It was cool. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yep. Yep. So. All right, man. Let's wrap it up. Yep. Tired. I'm ready for bed. <laughs> all right. Sounds good. We didn't go that long. No, nah, we only went an hour and 20 minutes or so. We don't care how long we go. No, it doesn't matter. Did you see that? Uh, I haven't listened to it, but did you see that uh, uh, Brett Vaughn Paul called this podcast yesterday? What did he call it? Something raw. Did you see that? No. Yeah. No That's kidding. Okay. Yeah, I can't remember the name. I can't remember. Let me look it up. Yeah, look it's that up. Pretty obvious. Well, I'll tell you what, man. Houndsman XP was the original podcast about these hounds and talking about this stuff. And a lot of people have jumped in the jumped in the pond trying to find their place. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm glad for it. I really am. I'm glad that that's kind of what we were look, shooting for in the beginning. There was a time when I was like, crap, you know. There's another there's another podcast popping up and competing with us. But the overall goal was always to get the reason we were losing so much is because nobody ever talked about hounds and what we did and who we were and, and stuff like that. And the more people that are talking about that's how deer hunting got big. That's how turkey hunting got big is people were talking about it and saying, we're here. We have a good time. We're doing good stuff. So the more good voices we can have out there supporting our lifestyle, come on, keep talking. Yeah, yeah there's room for everybody. Mm -hmm. What's the name of his podcast? A uh, hundred beers too late. No, well, born a, born a hundred years too late. Well, no, that's the one where he does like. He, he puts those like Dell Lee tapes out and stuff. He's got a different name for like the one that he just does live on Monday. 
Yeah, I don't. I'm not sure. I'm not seeing it on his profile. Yeah, you'll see it or look it up. You'll see it. It's something. He says "brawl" and like has "brawl" in all capitals. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't see it. I'll find it and send it to you. It popped up on my YouTube yesterday, but I was maybe it's not a podcast. Maybe it's just one of his YouTube videos. No, it was a podcast. I didn't, huh. I didn't, I, yes, last night I was busy and I didn't have a chance to listen to it, but I saw yeah. it. Keep going, Brett. We love you, buddy. Keep doing what you do. <laughs> no, but that's what I'm saying, though, is like everybody, like, we're on to something, and I can tell, and people know it. Like, wait, until, people wait until we start taking the gloves off. I mean, there was another topic I was going to bring up tonight that I didn't bring up, but it's yeah. going to make people squirm. Yeah, I it's don't even think it. Yeah, and I don't even think it really has to be that. I mean, we can do that. But, just I, like but I think we, there's certain things that we got to talk about, Ed. We got to talk. We got to talk about the elephant in the room. And you know, we got to talk. Yeah, I think. I think we get people want to hear that. You know, they we're all dancing around this stuff, and we're we're tiptoeing around issues, and we're afraid of offending somebody, and. You know, oh, we, you know, we might not get 10, 10 listeners might drop our podcast this week because they'll be offended. Well, that's, that's exactly what the, everybody is. That's what our whole culture is being built on these days. There was a time, like, go back to that book of, of killing Patton. The reason George Patton wasn't liked is because he said it like it was. His troops loved him. Every, most of the people that, that served under him would walk through, hellfire and and to get there to to because he inspired him but the his fellow officers and the politicians didn't like him because he was too damn raw he would just tell it like it was i mean the guy would would sit there and pray about his troops he would grieve over his troops and then he would wasn't afraid to piss off the russians you know and yeah. and say stuff like I'd rather have a bunch of these Nazis convert them. I mean, he was ready to to recruit their Nazi POWs to go to war against Russia yeah. because they had more integrity and and better principles than the Russian hordes. And, and Pat was Pat was one of the last of those that bled from the front. Yeah. Yep. All all our military now tries to lead from behind. Yeah, no, we're like, I want that motherfucker on a horse, not all with his sword drawn, like leading the fucking charge. Yeah, you know? yeah. that's who. You, that's I mean, that's the definition of a leader, right? The dude in front, not the dude telling you what to do, but the dude in front, like showing you what to do. Right, right. Yep, for sure. Well, it's going to be an interesting ride. I've got some. I've got some doozies I want to hit on the podcast coming up. That's for sure. Yeah, it's gonna we'll make some next. people squirm. We'll probably get all kinds of hate mail. Yeah, we'll do it next week. I guess. <laughs> Don't tell me. I'm Don't not gonna tell, tell you. I'm not gonna tell you. All <laughs> right. Sounds them. good, man. Okay. Take care. See ya.